and welcome back to the AP US History Curriculum for Era 8. In this video, we'll be looking at topic 8.6, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1940s and 1950s. We'll look at the 1960s and beyond in a future video, paying attention to both how and why this movement developed and expanded. So let's get to it. Although Reconstruction had started this process, making promises to African Americans regarding equal protection of the laws and voting rights, it really hadn't been successful. There may have been constitutional amendments addressing the issues, but with the advent of Jim Crow laws and voter suppression tactics like poll taxes and literacy tests, plus Supreme Court decisions like Plessy v. Ferguson, which upheld racial segregation as the law of the land, little had truly been accomplished. During the 1940s and 50s, civil rights activists began to put pressure on the government to finally make good on those promises, and all three branches of government were involved. President Truman's Committee on Civil Rights advocated passage of laws to end lynching, to end the poll tax, to establish a permanent Fair Employment Practices Commission, to achieve the desegregation of the armed forces, to create a permanent civil rights division within the Justice Department, to eliminate grants and aid from the federal government to segregated institutions, and support for a legal assault on segregation in education, housing, and interstate transportation and the president followed through on what he could, signing an executive order in 1948 eliminating racial segregation in the armed forces, although it didn't go into effect until 1950, and he encouraged Congress to also get involved. Eventually, Congress proposed the 24th Amendment, which would outlaw poll taxes in federal elections. It was ratified in 1964. And in 1966, the Supreme Court joined in and outlawed poll taxes in state elections. Perhaps more well-known is the federal government's attempt to promote racial equality in the area of education. The Supreme Court issued rulings in 1950 regarding segregation in state-supported graduate-level education, as well as in admissions being denied solely on the basis of race at the college level. Then in 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court, under the new Chief Justice Earl Warren, a former California governor and opponent of President Eisenhower during the primary elections in 1952, issued a unanimous ruling in the case of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. The court declared that state laws establishing separate public schools for black and white students were inherently unequal and therefore unconstitutional. These laws had been in place since the court had approved Plessy v. Ferguson back in 1896. The court then ordered desegregation to proceed with, quote, all deliberate speed, unquote, although no specific timetable was set. Despite the order, few schools were integrated and there was massive public resistance, with some states even closing down their public schools for a short time. By 1960, less than 4% of children attended an integrated school, particularly in the southern states. The Brown decision ushered in a brief era of massive resistance, particularly in those southern states. In Arkansas in 1957, nine African-American students, later nicknamed the Little Rock Nine, attempted to enroll in Little Rock's Central High School. It was still a segregated school, even though it was more than three years after the Brown decision. The governor of Arkansas, Orville Fabus, initially prevented the Little Rock Nine from entering the school, going so far as to call out the Arkansas National Guard to block the students from entering. It was not until the intervention of President Eisenhower, who sent federal troops to enforce the integration and to protect the nine students, that it was finally integrated. A similar situation happened with Ruby Bridges when she attempted to integrate a elementary school in New Orleans, Louisiana. Despite their successes at being enrolled, Many of these students were subjected to a year of physical and verbal abuse by many of the white students. Just a few months later, in December of 1955, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She was arrested for violating the local segregation laws that required black citizens to sit in the back of buses and give up their seats to white patrons if the white section filled up. Encouraged by local ministers, including Martin Luther King Jr., who would emerge as a leader of this nonviolent protest movement, black residents of Montgomery began a nearly year-long boycott of the Montgomery bus system, nearly bankrupting it, since about 90% of the bus system's ridership 
were African Americans. This bus boycott would be the first major civil rights demonstration and showed the willingness of the people to adopt a philosophy of civil disobedience. Soon, sit-ins became the primary means for activists to force change peacefully, with one of the first successful sit-ins being at the lunch counter at the Woolworths department store in Greensboro, North Carolina. The main idea was nonviolent confrontation, passive resistance, and non-cooperation in order to bring justice where there was injustice. Actions such as the bus boycott and the lunch counter sit-ins would result in the striking down of the so-called Jim Crow laws in many parts of Alabama, North Carolina, and eventually throughout the U.S. This civil rights movement quickly became characterized by the slogan, We Shall Overcome, a popular spiritual that was sung in many churches, and it was eventually even recorded as a protest hymn to symbolize this movement. Well, here's what you need to know about the civil rights movement from 1945 to about 1960 legal victories, diverse forms of protest, and persistent efforts, despite opposition, all had played significant roles. And these efforts laid the foundation for events that are still to come. So be sure to keep up with your reading, and I'll catch you in the next video.